First of all, Matthew chapter 27 and also Luke chapter 23. Matthew 27. And Luke 23. I'll give you a moment to find both of those places. Matthew 27. And I'm going to begin reading there at verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, Save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same, in his teeth. That expression to cast the same in his teeth simply means that they were all trying to turn Christ's words around and use his words against him at that moment. Look forward, if you will, at Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. And we'll begin there with verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we, indeed, justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. We read in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, about the woman who poured uh, precious ointment on the head of the Lord. And he said, uh, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. There in uh, Matthew 26. Verse 13. And I think in a similar way, the account of this one thief who repented on the cross next to Christ is also one of one that will never be forgotten. It's it's still talked about, it's still preached about. Uh, God thought it worthy enough to include in his scriptures, and so we're still reading it. And it's a good thing that these verses should be well known. They've comforted many a troubled heart. Uh, at different times in their life, they brought peace to many people who had a worried conscience over one thing or another. And uh, they've been a real a healing medicine to people whose hearts were wounded, souls that were sick because of the sin they had committed. And it's given a rest on the pillows of many people who weren't sure where to turn in their hours of desperation. And it's brought a healing medicine to people uh, who needed that kind of uh, touch from God. And I want to draw out several lessons from these passages about the, the uh, repentant thief and the other thief next to him. And I call this sermon, Three Men at the Last. Three Men at the Last. But first of all, I want to consider the Savior. Consider the Savior. We've meant... We're meant to see in this story uh, the power and the, the willingness of Jesus Christ to save sinners. The prophet Isaiah foretold of the, the glorious reign of Christ one day. And he writes, Who is this that cometh from Edom, 
with dyed garments from Bozrah, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And then he answers the question, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save, Isaiah 63, verse 1. There's a passage where God is prophesying of himself in the person of Christ, coming back in glory to rule over the world one day. And um, But this, this thief who repented, could there have been a more desperate um, and wicked uh, case of a sinner in more dire straits than that sinner, the repentant thief? Uh, he was a wicked man by anyone's definition, um, a malefactor. That means someone who breaks the law, someone who does evil. And he was a thief, maybe even a murderer. Uh, we know this because only such criminals were punished this way by uh, execution. And he had lived wickedly, and it seemed that he was determined to die wickedly because at first, the, the first passage in the book of Matthew said both of the thieves were uh, railing against Jesus Christ. Excuse me. He was a dying man and unable to move his hands, nailed to the cross or his feet. Uh, he was hovering right over the precipice of hell in just a little while. In just a little while, he was going to die and enter into hell. And he was hanging on a cross from which he would never come down alive. And there was a grave waiting for him at the end of the day before all was said and done. And if there was ever a, a, a fallen son of of Adam, who the devil was going to take to hell that day. This was one of them. But notice what happened. He stopped mocking and he stopped blaspheming as he had done at first. He must have seen Christ. Um, he must have seen how Christ had forgiven those who had uh, scourged him and tortured him before hanging, nailing him to a cross. And he must have realized there was something different about him uh, compared to every other man he'd ever known. And he turned to the Lord Jesus. Um, it says he said, but that was a prayer. When you talk to God, that's prayer. And when you make a humble plea to the Son of God, that's prayer. And he prayed, he asked that um, when Christ died, he would take this man into his kingdom with him. And he asked that his soul would be cared for and his sins would be forgiven. And um, he thought kindly uh, of a better world later on. And notice the answer that he received from the Lord Jesus. Now, some people might have thought that there was that he was too wicked to be forgiven. And he's, he's burned all of his bridges. He's got no more chances, but not so. Some uh, might think that, or might doubt his sincerity. You know, everybody turns to God when they're thrown in prison, right? Somebody's... Uh, being told he's going to be uh, executed. Um, suddenly he gets God. He gets religion. And I mean, like a lot of politicians do when they want to get votes. They suddenly turn to God and get religion. Try to appeal to uh, religious voters. And so you wonder about people's motives. You wonder about their sincerity oftentimes. But in this case, not so. Excuse me. I got fat fingers today. And the Lord uh, forgave this man immediately. Uh, he spoke kindly to him. He pardoned the man completely. Uh, he cleansed him thoroughly. And he received him graciously as his son. And he justified this man freely, apart from anything he could possibly think of doing to win God's favor. And he saved him from the gates of hell that day. And he gave this man a title. And he gave him a claim to glory that he never could have imagined uh, previously. And of all the multitudes ever saved, uh, how many have received the direct words from Jesus Christ, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise? Talk about eternal security. Yeah, the day wasn't going to end well, but eternity was going to be wonderful. And uh, in the very day that Christ was at his weakest, he showed that he's still a strong deliverer. When they mocked him, saying he saved others, 
himself he cannot save, he was able to save the soul of someone next to him. Unable to save himself off that cross, perhaps, but still able to save a soul from the consequence of sin and eternity in hell and uh, the judgment of sin that awaits everybody without Jesus Christ. When his body was in pain, he showed tenderness to someone else. Uh, Peter says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. And the time when Jesus Christ himself was dying, he granted eternal life to someone else. Paul wrote, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And uh, the Bible says that Christ is able to save also, uh, is also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, Hebrews 7, verse 25. And if there is ever a sinner who seemed too far gone to be helped, it would have been this man. But not when the Lord Jesus Christ gets involved. You know what you want more than anything else is you want Jesus Christ to get involved with your problem. Once he gets involved, it's resolved. The answer is on the way. Might not have been the answer you thought, uh, but God's answers are always better than your answers. And his timetable is always better than your timetable. His will is better than your will. What he sees good for you, you might not see how there could be any good come from it. How it could benefit you in the slightest. Because you're always thinking of the here and now, what satisfies my feelings, what satisfies my flesh right now. Sometimes God wants something to build character in you. You can't accumulate 25 years of problems and expect God to fix it in 25 minutes. You need to learn patience. You need to learn the long suffering of God. God's been patient with you, puts up with you for 25 years, uh, committing all kinds of problems and raising hell like every other uh, sinner out in the world and then uh, expect him to fix it in a 25 minute prayer meeting. That doesn't work that way. Some we wish we did, but that's our flesh talking. No other transaction in the world is that way. You can't be the, the worst employee on your job for 10 years and skate by and let everybody else do your work for you and figuring you're not going to get noticed. And once it gets found out, suddenly be a model employee the next week. No, nobody's going to look at you that way. You're going to have to earn that respect back if you ever have it again. And so... Uh, if there was ever someone that seemed too bad to be received by God, it was this man. And yet just when he needed it most, the doors of mercy swung, swung wide open for him. We have a Savior that's not only able to save, but he's willing to. Christ wants to save sinners. I'm glad he wants to. Because there's sure plenty out there that need it. I wish they'd realize how simple it is and how much God wants to do for them. He said, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out, John 6, 37. This thief was never baptized. He never joined a church. He never gave money to some charitable work. He never paid tithes at uh, the local uh, church house. He never sat under the preaching of the Bible. He never had anyone teach him anything. He never took the Lord's Supper. He never did any number of things people think are necessary to be saved. But he, have no, he had enough faith to believe, and that was sufficient. The youngest faith of someone, of a lost soul, will save that lost soul. If it's genuine, if it's genuine, Jesus Christ wants to save sinners. Uh, this man's faith was only a few minutes old, but it was uh, enough to rescue him from hell. Think about a, a marvelous miracle that is. You can be a hell raiser for 45 years and suddenly turn to Jesus Christ, admitting your guilt, understanding that you've been doing all the wrong way and you're not going to get to heaven on your own power. You need what God can do for you. Once you do that, you are now a saint. You know, the world wants to define what a saint is. Not all saints live saintly. 
There's a distinction between those are two different words. To be a saint and to live saintly. The world thinks you have to live saintly before you can be referred to as a saint. That's the Catholic Church's nonsense. That's the Catholic Church and the Pope's garbage. Uh, not, one, not a single one of them is a saint. I don't know any Pope that went to heaven, best as we can figure, studying their history. You know what? There are some Catholic Popes, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, that uh, according to their, their authority, their, the authority they think they have, some Popes uh, have been spending eternity or, or centuries in purgatory hoping to uh, be released from there and go all the way to heaven. They're not there yet. You know, I've talked about them. I'm getting off the main road. I'll get back on the highway in a minute here, but let's just go down this one cul-de-sac. On a timeline, we all think linear. One thing follows after another in a logical progression. On a timeline, how is it that somebody here on the earth, popes and cardinals and so can promote someone who is farther along on the timeline to a higher status. I mean, at my job, my boss, who's, who has a higher status than I have, he can give me a raise. But I can't give him a raise, right? I can't promote him because he has a higher status than I have. And presumably, someone who's died and left this world is now in heaven in the ethereal world of angels and clouds and all that. How is it that a bunch of guys uh, in funny costumes in Vatican can decide that this person who's already gone on is worthy of a higher promotion? It doesn't logically follow. That's not how most things work out. Uh, but they presume that it does and they think they, they claim that authority to themselves. But the collective body of Jesus Christ, that is all believers, all members of Christ's church, that body of believers stretches back in time all the way to that dying thief on the cross next to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's an unbroken chain. And uh, that guy and you are in the same body of saints, the same body of Christians, the same body that make up the bride of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, uh, and he has no higher distinction in the church than you do. He had a special um, encounter with the Lord Jesus, but when you got saved, wasn't that a special encounter? I, I think about my salvation 51 years later, sometimes I still br am brought to tears. It was that big of a blessing to me. But um, no man should ever despair or lose hope. Christ is the same Savior now as he was when that guy was hanging on the cross next to him. He's still able to save to the uttermost, and he wants to save sinners. Uh, the gospel song says, Once from my poor sin sick soul, Christ did every burden roll. Now I walk redeemed and whole, hand in hand with Jesus. And there's another one that says, Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven. And found a savior to save a poor lost soul like me. And um, if you trusted in Jesus Christ to be your savior. Then you have everything that that sinner, that repentant thief uh, had and has. And he has no higher status in the body of Jesus Christ than you do. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.20. That means the president, that means the pope, that means your congressman, that means your parents, that means your next door neighbor, your boss, your friends, that means you. And uh, if you've never turned from your sin, would you be willing to? Would you be willing to admit, you know, I'm rotten. There's no getting around it. I, I've cheated a lot of people, I've done a lot of stupid bad things, and uh, if someone's going to be judged for their sins, I deserve to be judged. Is there, that, is there enough humility in you to admit that? If you've never trusted Christ to save you, do you have enough humility, enough good sense to admit you're not as great as you think you are? 
but to say, Father, I confess I'm a sinner in your sight. And if the Bible's true, I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell, Lord. And in the best way I know how, I'm asking that God, that you'd save me and make all the righteousness of Christ mine, put my sin on Christ and rescue me from eternity in hell. That's what that sinner did. As I said earlier today, he didn't have time to join a church, didn't have time to do any number of things that we think are part of becoming a true Christian. Didn't have time to do any of that. But the keys of death and hell are in the hands of the Lord Jesus, according to Revelation 1.18. And if he opens the way of eternal life to a sinner, then no man can shut it. And you'd be a fool not to walk through it. But um, he's a wonderful Savior. Secondly, I want to consider the sinner. That is, the other thief on the other cross who did not turn to Christ in his final hours. We often forget about that guy. There were two thieves, and we emphasize the one who returned or repented and turned to Christ, and we often forget about the other guy. What became of him? Why didn't he turn to the Lord, cry out for salvation? We can say that this thief was uh, uh, no more, no worse than the first one. There's nothing to demonstrate that, to indicate that. Both were uh, plainly wicked men. Both were receiving the just punishments for their deeds. Both were now hanging on crosses next to the Lord Jesus on either side. Both men heard him pray when he was forgiving their, his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Both men would see him suffering patiently, taking his uh, abuse. And uh, one repented, the other did not. He just continued to complain and rail against Jesus Christ. And uh, one was converted in the last hours by turning to Christ as his uh, Savior and his only hope. The other died condemned by not doing so. A strange thing, the way human nature is. And I guess we're supposed to learn that a so-called deathbed repentance, like the thief who did turn to Christ, uh, is certainly possible. But it's not something you want to count on. Don't think that once you're sick, hopefully you're going to die a nice old age and be cared for in a nursing home someplace or uh, by uh, uh, people attending you and you'll have your mind and your wits about you and then you'll beside, decide to trust Jesus Christ. You know something? If you put it off till then, even if all those things fall into place like that, your motive is probably not right with God. You've gotten everything you wanted up to that point. Why, why turn to God now? Your heart probably wouldn't be right to turn to Jesus anyway. Some people repent of their sins and, and they turn to Christ in their final hours, but it doesn't always follow that they will. So don't, don't think that everybody will if they get to that. But we always we kind of like think of older people. Well, they've been around longer than we have and they grew up in a different time, a different era. And uh, they heard a lot different, a lot more preaching than we heard, and they're more moral and, and uh, minded than we than the current generation is. And all that may be true, but it doesn't automatically mean that that old person's saved. I work in a funeral home during the week. I've told you stories about some of the families that we've served and some of the things I've seen. We buried a guy yesterday. And people bring in video slideshows of collections of all the pictures they've put together. And uh, this old guy, uh, how, do, what do you, how do you describe a guy that's a lush? You say he was a drinker, he liked alcohol, he was partial to, to imbibe and a number of other things. But all, half the pictures on the slideshow were him drinking. And I don't mean a bottle of beer or a can of beer. I mean a big thing of... Uh, rum or whiskey or just two hands right out of the bottle. Half the pictures with that guy. The other half was him giving the middle finger to the photographer. And that Catholic priest came in there and preached him into heaven just like he'd preach anybody into heaven. And uh, there was no indication that the guy ever knew Jesus Christ, ever thought about Jesus, ever had any time for Jesus Christ. And so just to say, well, he's old and he grew up in a different time period and he's probably, you know, more tender hearted toward things of God. Not so. Um, 
I worked a funeral service for a lady that was 104 years old. And uh, granddaughter came up to talk about grandma. Grandma took me to uh, Laughlin. We went to Vegas a few times, and she really liked the slots and uh, how much grandma had taught her to, to enjoy booze and like drinking. And uh, not a single word about Jesus Christ. Not a single word about Jesus Christ. And the, uh, the uh, I don't know if he's a Catholic or an Episcopalian minister, preached that lady into heaven just like she had been there all of her life. Not a single word about Jesus Christ or that lady ever turning to God as a sinner who needed Jesus Christ. There was one funny, one little funny thing I'll tell you about. These ministers, they grab a handful of dirt and they want to kind of put it over the casket, sprinkle it on ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Sometimes they make the pattern of the cross on there. It had rained maybe the week before. The ground was still kind of moist. So this minister, he got this big ball of clay or, or mud and kind of packed it into a, into a, a ball and just set it there on the, on the podium before he spoke. We're out in the cemetery, and uh, he thought it would just sort of break apart and spread out over the casket when he threw it. He threw it, and it stayed together. Boom. Hit that casket like you're throwing a softball or a baseball at somebody. It was the most comical thing. I, I, had, I had to fight laughing right there when he did it. But don't depend on... on um, on people being saved just because they're old or older. Sorry about that, those of you who are older than me. But uh, two people can grow up the same way, be exposed to the same preaching, hear the same Bible verses, maybe go to the same church, uh, be exposed to the same Sunday school teacher, the same sermons. They can hear the gospel presented in very similar ways. One can receive it and the other cannot, will not. The Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. And the psalmist warned Israel, saying, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my work. Psalm 95, verses 7 through 9. King Solomon wrote, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men uh, is fully set in them to do evil, Ecclesiastes 8.11. Because you get away with sin for a while, you think you're always going to get away with it. You don't need Jesus Christ. But um, the Apostle Paul instructed the New Testament ministers saying, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, 2 Timothy 2, 25. Some people are their own worst enemy when it comes to believing the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace of God. Through bitterness and hardness of their heart and stubbornness, they don't want to admit that they're a sinner who needs to be forgiven. You know, only a, a sinner can be forgiven. So unless you're willing to Admit that much, acknowledge that much, uh, don't expect to be saved. And that was the problem with this dying thief next to the Lord Jesus. He had been saying no to God all of his life and for so long, um, no to authority, no to the law of Moses, no to the laws of the, the Roman Empire. For so long, uh, all that rebellion, all that disobedience finally became a curse to him. He's hanging there on the cross next to the Son of God, the one who could save him, and still had no interest in it. In Noah's day, God said, My spirit will not always strive with man. Genesis 6, verse 3. Now, obviously, he was referring to the uh, impending flood that was about to come. And man only had so much time to repent and get ready for it. But there's a great spiritual lesson to be learned from that. Um, the time to turn to God, the time to trust Jesus Christ... The time to believe the Bible is telling you the truth is when the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart and convicting you of those things. You keep saying no to it, no to it, no to it. I don't want it. I'm not interested in it. Don't talk to me about it. Stop inviting me to church. Stop talking about religion. Stop talking about the Bible. Eventually, God can say, okay, I've had enough time. I've wasted enough time on that guy. Move on to somebody else. Say, pastor, preacher, do you think God would actually do that? 
not only would God do it, God has done it. In Matthew 27, Pilate was willing to let Christ go free. The angry crowds uh, shout, uh, shouted back to him, let him be crucified, let him be crucified. And when he told them, I am innocent of the blood of this just man, see ye to it, they responded, his blood be on us and on our children. Matthew 27, verses 25, 22 to 25. And uh, do you think those were words that the Heavenly Father could hear and take lightly, ignore? His blood be on us and on our children. And Jews wonder why people hate them, why they've been despised, why they've been kicked from pillar to post all over the world for the last 2,000 years. They can't figure it out. Well, look back at what your ancestors did. Read what your ancestors said about the Messiah, and they didn't want anything to do with him. And the city of Corinth, the Bible says that Paul was preaching in the synagogues every Sabbath day, and he preached, uh, it was says, the Bible says he was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ, that's the Messiah, and when they opposed themselves, there's that wording again, and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean from henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles, Acts 18, verses 5 and 6. Um, if they did, if they died lost, it was because of their own stubbornness. They became their own worst enemies when it came to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the Jews continued to reject Christ, he told them in the city of Rome, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it, Acts 28, 28. That's why most of the New Testament church has been com composed of Gentiles, non-Jewish nations throughout the world. So yes, the Lord may stop giving you an opportunity. He might stop sending some friend by to witness to you or to talk to you about Jesus Christ. He might stop giving you chances to go to someone's church and hear the gospel preach or hear the Bible explained and open up to you. He said, I've wasted enough time on that person. Uh, let them go their own way if that's what they want. You know, it's been said, never put off till tomorrow what you ought to do today. Never put off, or Americans, we like to say, never put off till tomorrow what you can put off till the day after tomorrow. But the unrepentant thief died that day next to Jesus Christ, next to the only one who could have saved him, next to the only one who could have forgiven him, and uh, said, I'm not interested in it. And lastly, let me consider... The saint, the saint. We know that one of the men repented and he was received by Christ, but there's more to him than just that. The repentant thief uh, left evidences. In that short section we read in the book of Luke, he left evidences that the Holy Spirit of God had been working in him, even just for a brief time. And it seems whether God converts a man in his final hours, as he did this guy, or maybe someone who went to church and someone talked to him for six years and he finally decided to get right with God and get saved, and then he lives a long, uh, productive life as a Christian after that. The certain elements are common in both cases. Um, first, notice the, the strength of this man's faith. He called Jesus Lord in his dying hours, or in verse 42, Luke 27, 42. Every sinner needs to recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord, that is God in human form. The modern Bibles, in the modern Bibles, he simply says, Jesus, remember me. And they take the Lordship of Jesus out of the sinner's mouth right at his moment of conversion. Paul and Silas didn't tell the Philippian jailer, Acts 16, believe on Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He said, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The Bible says that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. So, the, so we know the Holy Spirit was at work in this man's heart. He declared his belief that Jesus Christ uh, would have a kingdom. This much he believed. He believed that Christ was able to give him glory and eternal life, uh, in his plea to Jesus Christ. He maintained the innocence of Christ against all the charges that had been brought against him. 
but this man hath done nothing amiss. He told his friend, verse 41, others standing by might have thought Christ had never done anything wrong, but this guy said it openly. He said it loud enough for the other guy on the other cross to hear, and you know how scenes like that would be. There's probably a lot of conversation, a lot of um, commotion going on on the ground, uh, people there, crowd gathering. So he had to say it loud enough for the other guy to hear. And all of this was happening while the rest of the nation had denied Jesus Christ. And they shouted, crucify him. We have no other king but Caesar, John 19. Christ's own disciples had forsaken him and fled. When he was hanging on the cross, faint, bleeding to death, naked, humiliated, uh, a numbered with the transgressors, as Isaiah said he would be, in a death of disgrace and shame, that's when this guy decided to believe in him. The Holy Spirit was working in this guy's heart. That's when he decided to turn to Jesus Christ and call out for help. And the disciples had seen mighty signs and miracles done by Christ. They'd seen the Lord Jesus heal lepers and cause blind eyes to see, to raise cripples back up to their feet. They'd uh, seen Christ walking on the water as though it were simply dry land. They'd seen him feed thousands of people with just a handful of loaves and fishes. And um, some of them even enjoyed a, a foretaste of Christ's second coming, the Mount of Transfiguration. A dying thief saw none of those things. He saw a naked, bloody Savior on the cross next to him, the same predicament he was in, who had grace and mercy and love and compassion and tenderness to the people who were crucifying him and forgiveness and um, and something inside said, trust that man. Turn to that man. He can help you. It's a miracle indeed. And uh, something inside you told you you're a sinner. And uh, you need to respond to the gospel. You need to believe what you read in the back of that track. You need to believe what your friend said. You need to believe what the preacher says. And uh, trust Jesus Christ alone to save you. Something like that was at work in you the day you got saved, the day you trusted Christ to forgive you and write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. But this dying thief, he saw no scepter in Christ's hand. He saw no royal robe. He saw no splendor. And yet, he trusted him anyway. He had the right sense of sin as well, we might say. He said to his friend, We receive the due reward of our deeds, verse 41. The Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. So he acknowledged his own ungodliness, his own wickedness, and, that the, and the justice of the punishment that they were both receiving. And he was humbled at that moment. He was no longer going to make any excuses for himself. And this is what every sinner needs to, to do. First of all, admit you're a sinner. Admit there's something wrong with you. You know, when we talk about planting the gospel as planting a seed in the heart of someone hoping it'll germinate and come to life uh, and in salvation, I mentioned to you before, there's also such a thing as planting seeds of doubt. You have to get that person to stop trusting the thing that they've been trusting and start trusting in Jesus Christ alone. And so that comes into play. Um, years after his conversion, the Apostle Paul still wrote, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. That's the estimation he had of himself years after he had trusted Christ to save him. 1 Timothy 1.15 or 2.15. Robert Schuller, Hour of Power, um, Crystal Cathedral and all that, he wrote this in 1984, Christianity Today, October 5th, 1984. I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ and under the banner of Christianity 
that has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelism enterprise than the often crude, uncouth, and unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. <laughs> well, thank the Lord he's dead now. He can't do any more harm to the body of Christ. But unless a man admits that his, his lost and sinful condition, he's not ready to get saved. That's the first thing necessary. And while all of this was at work in the heart of the, the, the thief, notice the brotherly love he showed to the other thief. He tried to stop him from continuing his blasphemies. Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Verse 40. The saving work of the Holy Ghost, the saving grace of God, uh, it shakes a man out of his uh, complacency, uh, his selfishness. It helps him to see the need in the lives and the souls of other people. And when Saul of Tarsus was converted, he went to the synagogue the first chance he got. And the Bible says he preached that Jesus, that he is the Son of God, Acts 9.20. When the Samaritan woman encountered Christ, John chapter 4, she left her water pot and went back to the village telling everybody, come see a man that told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? You know, once you get a real dose of salvation, once you've come to God as a sinner in need, and God does a saving work in your heart and life and your soul, you want to tell somebody else about it. At least it ought to be the natural response that I can't keep it to myself. And in a sense, you can see the finished work of, of the Holy Spirit in this repentant thief. Every part of the believer's good character can be traced uh, in the life of this man, his final hours, his faith, his humility, uh, his prayer to Jesus Christ, his brotherly love to the other sinner, uh, are all witnessed by the fact of his repentance. And uh, he wasn't a believer in name only, but in deed and in truth. He was truly a saint of God. And I'll try to bring this to a, a close. The unbelieving thief also had certain telltale signs of being unsaved. He had heard of Christ. I mean, at that time, everyone had heard of Christ. Even the two sinners on either side of him. And after seeing how the Lord Jesus forgave his persecutors, he wasn't moved at all. He was a skeptic up to the very end. If thou be Christ, and um, he was uh, selfish, save thyself and us. Show me a miracle before I believe. You know, you get, you get 33 and a half years of miracles already. Uh, everybody was talking about it. Jesus was the talk of the town. Let me put it that way. To have not uh, heard and say, well, show me a miracle. That is to demand of God to do something to prove to you that he is real. If you read the Bible and you can't discern that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and God is real, then nothing else is going to convince you. I've talked, I've said this before. I know that the word, I know that the Lord God of the Bible exists because the people of the Bible, the Jew, still exists. When whole armies and nations and governments have tried to wipe the race out and they had no one to protect themselves except God. If God's protecting you, trust me, there is no force of man that can destroy you. But uh, let me bring this to a close. These three men at the last, we can see a stubborn fool who went into eternity unprepared and lost forever. One man who came to his senses and turned to Jesus Christ in the last few moments of his life. And thirdly, the Savior, who's not only able to save, but is willing to save and wants to save sinners.